Okay, it's great to be here. Let me just bring out my pen and make sure my pen is working. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so let me get more audible, your voice more audible, louder. Is it clear? Is it clear? Yeah, it's clear. It's clear right now. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, in this second session, um, thank you, Brian, for the, the other session. Now that we've understood how APIs work, the types of APIs, right? As auditors, you know, we should be able to, you know, like audit APIs in terms of find out um, different points of misconfigurations. We should be familiar with different vulnerabilities such that, you know, when we test APIs from their behavior, we are able to tell that something is wrong with this API or this API was not fitting was not um, configured properly. Okay. Um, is anybody writing on the screen? Okay. Um, I think someone is someone is writing on the screen. Can we okay. please not do that? On that side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whoever that is, you please undo. Okay. Um, now, um, hard coded credentials. So, um, in a lot of settings, right, and it's becoming more frequent, you find it more frequent in very mature organizations, right, in terms of um, API audits. The auditors also have access to the source codes, right? So, um, you know, and how do you have access to the source code? So, the developers, you know, they give you a username and a password to their repository, right? So a repository is where source code is actually stored. You know, all the developers, all their code, they store it up there, it's for version control and all that, right? So they give you access to this um, repository and they, you know, and you as an auditor, you have to go in there and, you know, try to understand the code or in very rare cases, they try to, you know, walk you through it, but they are too busy for that, right? So um in a lot of situations they just give you access to the code and to you know do whatever you like in terms of um, read only access so i will show us an example of um of this code so can you see my chrome yes we can okay so this is a sample repository that you know a developer has given me access to it will look like something like this right it will, you see a lot of files, a lot of configuration files, you see a lot of folders, you know, if you go into each one, you know, you don't want to start opening each one looking for, you know, um, point of misconfiguration. So the, one of the easiest vulnerabilities to find, one of the easiest vulnerabilities to find here is um, hard coded credentials. And you can do that by, you know, searching for keywords such as password. So if I type password here, and I make sure I look in this repository, you know, it comes up with a list of files containing that keyword that I searched for. So in this part, in the first one, I see something like a config.xml. You know, the config tells me that, okay, this is a configuration file, which makes sense. Configuration files usually contain, you know, um, configured parameters or configured, um, you know, credentials. So I open this and if I look closely, I see that, oh, okay, there is a login as test and there is a password as test. So this is a hard coded credential, maybe something that was left by a developer. I also see for DB access, the type of DB is my SQL, the login is root and the password is root, right? So as an auditor, two things, in fact, I'm seeing three things now, three things jump out to me here, right? Now, the first is the issue of hard coded credentials, right? The second one is weak credentials, okay? And the last one, the, the one that has to do with credentials is the fact that root is being used by the application to assess the database, right? Every auditor should know this, that you do not, um, you know, principle of least privilege. You give the application just the right amount of access to the database, right? So create, um, an account for the application of the database and make sure you assign it just the right privilege to do this, okay? 
So that, that's it for hard coded credentials. Um, you can, apart from password, you can also search for API, you can also search for key, you can also search for login, you know, anything that comes to mind. You can also search for roots, you know, if they tell you that, okay, it's based on the Linux system, just search for roots, just search for admin, right? You know, um, all those things can help you, can help point out um, hard coded credentials. Okay. Now let's look at another case of information disclosure. Now, how do you detect this, right? Now, um, you can usually detect this by inserting random characters. So what I mean by random characters, like unexpected characters that the, um, that the API, in this case, no search does, did not expect, right? You remember when um, Ibrahim was talking about API, it's expecting some particular form of input. For example, it's expecting an integer or a string, right? And then you give it like a symbol, like at, right? Now, or you give it an apostrophe or a double quote, right? Now, um, the developer should have taken that extra effort to actually put in an exception handling mechanism. What an exception handling mechanism is, is just a control that handles unexpected input, right? It says that, okay, um, even though we expect a string, I want to put a, a, a code that will catch all other exceptions that says, okay, if it is not a string that is being put here, right, return this generic um, response to the user, maybe wrong input, right? Regardless, as long as that thing does not match a string, right? So um, developers call it try and catch, um, you know, code. You know that to um, so you try, you know what has been imputed here, and if it fails, you catch that error, and you know display a generic page. But in this case, um, the user, the auditor actually wants to search for tests, right? But in this case, the auditor puts in a double quote, which is here, put in an extra double quote. And in the extra um, double quote, it caused a syntax error at the back end and threw all sorts of error back to the auditor, right? So as an auditor looking at this system, you'll be like, this is giving up too much information. What I'm expected to see is, sorry, you know, this input is not supported, right? Without giving me this information. Now I know that, okay, there is a home folder, there is a DVWS node folder, there is a node, you know, modules folder, and this is not the type of thing that, you know, any um, well, well formed application should, you know, um, should return back to the user. So we call this out as an issue. Now, in terms of practicality, how will an auditor test this? Um, can you see my Bob Suite page? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So um, how will an auditor test this? So this is actually the API, you know, um, at the back end, right? So I'm going to search with this word test, you know, I see that, okay, nothing, that means there is no node called test, but then I decide to put in some, you know, characters in there and I see that, oh, okay, it actually handled these characters well. What about when I add an extra double quote, right? Let's see how it handles that and see that, you know, it doesn't handle it well and it actually, you know, breaks and gives me a lot of, you know, error messages, okay? So that's on the part of um, information disclosure. Okay, now let's look at sensitive data exposure, okay? Now, um, situations will arise where uh, maybe you see an API, it looks interesting, like for example, users, and um, this vulnerability is to showcase us, you know, how we are to um, complement, how we are to use practical testing to complement documentation review. So as an auditor, you want to know the response that this API returns. So you go to the documentation first, right? And you see that, okay, it returns um, the following, is the person admin, true or false, right? It returns the person's ID, and it also returns the person's username, right, from the documentation, okay? Now you decide to, okay, let me have a go at this, let me test this out, let me verify this, right? Now you make that request here, and from the response, 
what you get is, of course, you're able to see whether the person is admin, you're able to see the user ID as I said, you're able to see the username, but then you're also able to see the hashed password, right? This was not in the documentation, right? This is what the developer intended to achieve, but this is what ended up happening. And it's actually your job as an auditor to be able to, you know, know how to test this stuff and how to call out these kind of issues where um, sensitive data such as, you know, hash password or PII, that's personally identifiable information is being returned back to the um, user, right? So this is the situation and um, just in terms of practicality, in terms of um, demonstration, right? So this is the user API. If I send this, you know, it comes back with the password. You know, this day you go back to the developer, but you know, this was not in the documentation. Right, um, where did this come from? Why, why, what is the business justification for returning the user's hash password? Because someone can go in and you know take all this password and um and crack them and access and compromise the user attack. So, um, I know, um, Tony talked about you know something similar happening at LinkedIn. Probably this might be what might have happened, right? You cannot tell, okay. Let's go back to the slides and let's talk about the last one today. That is the insecure direct object reference. It's a mouthful of a technical word, but it's a very simple vulnerability. Okay, so let's look at a situation that a user called Kinedo is logged in and is able to assess his own personal notes, right? As shown in the first screenshot. So if I see, if I go to the API is slash API slash V2 slash passphrase. And I put and I put it in my username, right? Chinedo, and I'm able to see the notes that Chinedo put in there, right? Now I notice something as a smart auditor, I notice that okay, if I put in my username, right, it gives me my notes. What about if I change my username to someone else's username? Right? So um you now say, um, however, Chinedu is able to change to another username, let's say Choma in this case. And all he does to see Choma's notes is just switch his own username to Choma's username and is able to see Choma's notes, right? So this is what we refer to as insecure direct object reference. That means the, um, the user is able to insecurely, you know, directly reference the object of another user right so it's just like a lateral kind of escalation kind of thing, like a horizontal privilege escalation being able to see another user's um maybe resume if it's a hr site right by just changing your own name to the other person's name right so this is a very very common vulnerability with um apis and this is one we should also be mindful of for demonstration purpose, um, this is Chinedu, you know, making the request. And you can see this is my own notes, right? If I decide to change this Chinedu to Chioma, you know, and send the request, I'm able to see Chioma's um, response or Chioma's notes, which shouldn't be, right? So, because Chioma should be able to see um, only her notes. Chioma's notes should, should um, be seen by only her. Okay. All right. So um, those are just some of the vulnerabilities that exist. I just said for the sake of time, you know, and um, there are a lot of ones um, you can look at. We are going to also look at maybe one more as I show us like an example of a scanner, right? Um, so um, aside the manual technique that we just looked at in testing and API, there is also the automated technique, right? where we have access to scanners as auditors and we are able to you know put in the api and click on the scan and the automated tool sort of scans it for us now some examples of automated tools include check marks um bob suit soda cube and cr api right i'll be showing us an example with bob suit the ones i've been showing you since are also um with Boxit. Boxit is a very common um, vulnerability um, scanner. But you need to, I think there's a community edition and there is a, there is a commercial edition, right? Okay. Um, so 
Let's look at a sample Bob skill scan example. Now, some of us within our workplaces will be looking to get like, okay, we want to get a good API scanner. What should I look out for, right? Of course, what you look out for is, you know, um, make sure that, you know, it's one that has the, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it has like the least false positives, right? In terms of uh, its results are accurate. It also shows you the details of the vulnerabilities that it has found. Now, in this case, we are looking at the, um, I clicked on SQL injection, right? And um, you can see here, it gives actually all the URLs that, all the APIs or URLs that it's actually identified and is scanning for. It also gives you the request uh, response, right? And it also gives you some advisory regarding, okay, this is SQL injection. It gives you severity. <laughs> It also gives, describes the issue detail and the issue background. If I change to my box suit, I think I still have it here. Yeah. So if I click it here, right, I see that, okay, this is telling me, um, this is a case of SQL injection, right? Now I'll be like, okay, how did it determine this, right? So I go to request one, I see what it did. It inserted a, semi um, a single code. It saw that it got an error. I go to request two. It decided double quotes. I see that, okay, it didn't get anything. Then I go to request three. And I saw that it put in um, a sort of um, database query. And, you know, it got back some results. So it short, sort of like shows me how it was able to determine that this is vulnerable to SQL injection. And very importantly, because um, the value you add is the fact that, you know, the issue is replicated. It also um, <coughs> gives the, uh, you know, remediation steps, right? So give different remediation steps, depends on that to make sure that, you know, whichever one is applicable to the um, developer, he or she can actually go on and implement, okay? And I think, um, I think that is it for me. And um, I'll hand it over to the next presenter for um, auditing APIs. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chinedu. Right, um, just thank to you. before we bring on the next um, speaker, there are a few questions here. I know we said we wait till the end, but we can do <coughs> some previous questions. Abbas is asking if we can do this scanning with Bob Suit Community Edition. Um, no, you can't do this scanning with Bob Suit um, Community Edition. You have to get the professional license. And then uh, Olufela was asking, good day and well done. Is there a guide for testing APIs? Yes, some of what we've done. OWASP Top 10 provides you with a guide. The automated tools also helps you with a guide. The next um, session will also show us some of the things that we need to be checking out when we are carrying out an audit of an API. So um, from your information request list to the basis for which we are making those collections and some of the test procedures that we want to conduct. So um, Ife, please go ahead. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, wherever we are, from, wherever we are joining from. Um, I don't know if you can hear me clearly. 